Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill King, and I would like to welcome you to this momentous event on behalf of the Wilderness Canoe Association. I feel I have the privilege of doing so mainly on the basis of having come into the association along with the furniture and being equally difficult to get rid of. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to the interesting stuff. Um, I've just been informed that we have a tag team presentation uh, to start us off, which uh, delights me. Uh, David and Adrian Green are doing the perfect kickoff to a canoeing symposium by talking about a momentous uh, snowshoe trip. Uh, some, some 330 kilometers uh, along the north shore of the St. Lawrence, which, at least for the sake of their dog, I sincerely hope they did in segments. Uh, in any event, David and Adrian. Are we on? Ooh, we're on. We are on. Hi. Well, what, a, what an honor to be here and to be speaking to you tonight and to be first. It's, it's really is special to us. It's been a dream of ours for a long time, so thank you. Yeah, this is really exciting. <laughs> um, so, hello. We're going to introduce ourselves. And we're going to start with this handsome man right here. So a year ago tonight, we were at the beginning stages of our trip, of our snowshoe trip on Quebec's lower North Shore. And in honor of that, I'm going to read an excerpt from our journal. February 24th, 2016. Weather. Really cold, really warm, sunny, cloudy, snowy, a.k.a. everything. Had to get up, in the, had to, get up to pee in the middle of the night. Total fiasco. Couldn't find my boots, almost peed myself. It was very cold, minus 26 in the morning. Up at 6 a.m. on the trail by 9.15. Not bad. Seems to take about three hours to make all the water for teas, coffee, soup, eat breakfast, take down, pack the sleds, and of course, poop. We walked across lakes, portages, and a large saltwater bay, and over many hills. Today, we knew we had to make it to Tete la Belen, no matter what because of a coming rainstorm tomorrow. Rain. So I'm Adrian, this is Dave, and we are very fortunate to be here from the beautiful Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. And we have a third team member that could not join us because of this expedition. She is not so fond of flying in airplanes, but that's Osa. She's the cute member of the team and we're very, very, very grateful to have had her on this expedition. Now, traditionally, we, we think of the waters of Canada that were plied by canoes, by the voyageurs and the Aboriginal people before them. But these waterways can also offer fantastic highway in the wintertime when they are frozen solid and open up the country as a wide, free place to roam. And this time of year, many of us that like to canoe are getting a little itchy for the springtime, the planning, the brainstorming, and looking at the map of Canada, wondering where we can go paddling. Dave and I grew tired of getting itchy for summer, and we decided to embrace the wonderful months of winter that we have in this country of Canada. And in doing so, we decided to make a winter trip happen for many reasons, which we will get into. But one of our biggest ones is that there's no bugs in the winter. And if any of you have been to Labrador or Quebec, there's bugs. So Dave, where did we go? Oh uh, yes, yeah. so for those of you who are unsure of where the lower north shore of Quebec is, this map illustrates it for us. So the lower north shore refers to the north shore of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but the lower side of northern Quebec. So we brought it upon ourselves. At the end of a prior expedition, we had gone from Georgian Bay, Ontario, to blanc sur blanc and we discovered the Lower North Shore. And we said to ourselves, we're going back there one day. So we got, we got in our car in Nova Scotia. We traveled all the way up to Natashquan. Oops, there. That's good. And from Natashquan, we got into a plane, and we flew out to St. Augustine. Along the shoreline here, there are eight communities stretching over 330 kilometers. Some of these communities are Anglophone, some of them are Francophone, some of them are Innu. They are all very isolated from the rest of the world because there are no roads. 
And, and it is often referred to as the Forgotten Labrador. It was traditionally settled by Newfoundland fishermen seeking better fishing grounds. And when the lines were drawn in 1867, arbitrary line was drawn and ended up in Quebec. And because of this isolation, you get these really interesting communities that are made of different mixes of people that speak different languages, and each little town has very much its own identity. So we left from Nova Scotia, and it was no small feat for us to get our truck to here. It took two days of traveling, plus a ferry through a bay that was clogged up with ice. And then in a blizzard, we managed to take off and get ourselves all the way to St. Augustine, just in front of a crazy rainstorm that would actually make us take two weather days before actually starting the trip. But we were grateful to get there. And, and for those of you who have been on a large expedition before, you know that 90% of the work is complete once you get all of your gear and, your, and yourselves to the start line. Statistically speaking, that is the most dangerous part of the trip, yeah. is traveling. 90% of your work is done once you're there. Now you just have to travel. And I'll tell you, it was no small feat to get two people, a dog, and two very heavy sleds to the starting line. That's not Dave and I. <laughs> it would have been if we had met when we were little kids, though. So during the planning of this expedition, I am an elementary school teacher. It was very important to me to include a large educational component into this expedition. Mainly, one of the main reasons why we decided to go on an expedition in the wintertime, so that we can include schools uh, interactively into our expedition. And through that process, I developed a comprehensive community outreach and education plan. If anybody would like a copy, please track me down. I'd be happy to send you the PDF copy for free. It's more important for me to share this information with you. Through this plan, I developed lesson plans and curriculum outcome guides for teachers to be able to pick up in schools to be able to share this experience with their kids. Before we left, we did presentations at local schools in the Annapolis Valley. That's where this picture's from. While we were up there, we slept in four different schools and presented in five different schools. Uh, we talked about our ambitions and our goals and our dreams about putting down technology, engaging with the natural world, stepping outside and seeing what you are capable of doing. Yeah, using your body, finding peace in your mind and traveling through the wilderness. We also taught them about other places in Canada, such as where we were coming from. So we connected the kids where we were from with the kids on the lower North Shore and vice versa. And like Dave said, we didn't want to wait for winter because most students are in school during the winter time. So we had this whole interactive setup for the expedition. We uploaded stuff onto our website every day that we were out there so students could learn what we were learning because we really believe in sharing firsthand experiences with those that want to tune in. That's right. And through all of this, we tried to drum up a little bit of funding, um, which we, we managed to do um, through the uh, Royal Canadian Geographic Society. And not only did that cover our costs for transportation, which were enormous uh, for us, but it allowed us to broadcast our, our voice to a larger community. And that was a huge intention of this trip, is that what was exciting for us about this lower North Shore region, some of you may be quite familiar with it, but us, we had never really heard of it before our And I believe the vast majority of Canadians. Yeah, we'd never met anybody that had been there, never met anybody really that had heard of it, and that was kind of lit the fire under our bums to really share the story of this really intriguing place that there wasn't a ton of information about. So thanks to... We are encouraging all of you to go. It yeah. is beautiful. So the RCGS really helped us get our message even further, which is why they believed in us. No, Osa. <laughs> she was really important to us for many reasons, but she actually became the star of the entire expedition. She became this furry, friendly face that all of the students really got into. All of the grown-ups really got on board with Osa and the fact that she was out there with us. Um, she's way cuter than both Dave and I. She looks like a really cool, hard-working sled dog. She's not. She just looks the part and keeps our spirits up on the hardest of days by being very lighthearted. And through the course of the expedition, um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we communicated with people, but we were receiving messages every day from students and family and friends saying, how's Osa doing? Is Osa having fun? Is Osa staying warm enough? Is she liking what you're doing? It's Osa's birthday. Happy birthday to Osa. Dave and I were very much delightedly chopped liver compared to the dog. And that's fine. And Having a mascot really helps on those long, hard days. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a long, hard day right there. So you can see up here we used a mixture, and with what we're wearing up here, we combined 
traditional or old technology with new technology. Now this is really important because traditional older technology is heavier, yes, but it can be fixed out on the trail. If our anoraks were to be torn or ripped, we could fix them with a sewing machine or with a sewing kit. Same with our canvas tent and the wood stove and our snowshoes. Newer technology, it's lighter and it's harder to fix out on the trail, but at the same time we had a limited budget and we very much had to use a lot of gear that we already had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have very much in all of our trips synthesized knowledge from many different people, many different styles of gear, and nothing that we have done is new. We have just really borrowed from other people that have come before us. That's right. So these anoraks here, they, we, we got the design, the package from Lure of the North, from Dave and... Uh, Kylie. Kylie, up in, in the Sudbury area. Um, but they, in turn, learned their knowledge from Garrett and Alexander Conover, who, in turn, learned their, their, learned their knowledge from the First Nations people of Shefferville. So I'm sure Will Steger would say, say the same thing about his mucklucks. It's not new knowledge. We're just sharing the information mm -hmm. that we've learned from other people as well. Same with the new technology. Yeah, it was an honor to be sitting at my sewing machine for hours making these anoraks, knowing that I was not the first person to make these anoraks and that there's a very old traditional pattern. Oop. 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 There we go. <laughs> So our mucklucks, fortunately we had snowshoes from my parents, our snowshoes were older than us, mucklucks we chose to purchase, and we very much are grateful that, f actually as a wedding gift, we were given one of these beautiful snow trekker tents. And what's wonderful about these tents, and I highly encourage all of you to go experience traveling in this tent, or even just base camping in one of these tents, because they are a throwback to a traditional way of traveling, but with a modern spin that lets you have a glorious warm wood stove at the end of a hard day. And this wood stove, it was the centerpiece of our life, and it was very crucial to our survival. It also made a lot of work for us because we had to, every day, focus on gathering really good, really dry, really nice firewood, because that allowed us to melt all of our drinking water from the snow, that meant water for cooking. It also meant we could dry our gear out and be happy and cozy in. We cooked all our food on it, too. So traveling as traditionally as possible, we decided not to bring a backup gas stove. So we did not have an MSR stove with us whatsoever. So we relied heavily, 100%, on finding dry firewood. It was the most important thing we did. It was the hardest job of the day, but the most important as you well. You can't be lazy when the alternative is to just sit in a snowbank and be cold. That's kind of the inside of our tent. So this is some of the older traditional technology we use. We went for the newer stuff. We used pl plastic sleds. We had snow pants and down sleeping bags. We had rubber boots. Um, a lot of this stuff we adapted from other famous explorers of modern day, such as John Turk and such as Jerry Kobolenko. Um, we looked upon these people to, to learn. And so... We, we adopted a lot of the things we used from other people's experiences before us, again. Um, one piece of gear, though, that was very important for our goals was our DeLorme inReach uh, satellite Tracker. machine. Um, not only did we have it for backup for safety, but it allowed us to send out messages daily to our ground person back home who would update our blog with our distance traveled, animal encounters, weather, our, our daily haikus. And a story, and Osa's a observations, story. because she was all that mattered anyway. Yeah, so it gave us updates to go along with lessons plans that we had put together for the schools and the children who were following us along. This was a real mix of high tech and low tech, and we felt really comfortable in that it worked for us. Yeah, it was really important just to use what, what works for you. Now, now, Adrian, our sleds were really heavy and we traveled really far. We had to fuel ourselves somehow. We absolutely did. And I present to you the most glorious creation on the planet. This is a peanut butter, butter, and jelly sandwich. <laughs> this is actually two peanut butter, butter, and jelly sandwiches that over the course of the expedition got really crushed together and they were frozen, so we just broke the two of them in half. Dave pre-made all of them before the trip started. Each one of those is a caloric bomb of at least a thousand calories. And at the beginning of the trip, you know, we'd be hungry and we'd get greedy and you'd try and eat the whole sandwich and then you'd have to stand there and kind of like breathe it off for a while because it was so much sugar and fat. By the end of the trip, you could eat two of them no problem and be looking for a third and a fourth, maybe a fifth. It was amazing. And the only way they got better was if we deep fried them in bacon fat. <laughs> 
which we did on many occasions. <laughs> And I highly recommend it. It is amazing. We actually were out camping for the long weekend in our tent um, last weekend, and we did it for old time's sake. It tasted great, but we felt really sick because we hadn't been walking for 28 days at that point. But it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And obviously, in any trip, whether it's summer or winter, canoeing or walking or biking, the food is really important. It makes or breaks your happiness. It makes or breaks your success. And we take a lot of pride in dehydrating all of our own food, making our own granola, making our own granola bars, making our own peanut butter, butter and jellies. It's really, really important at the end of the day to know you've got awesome food awaiting for you. Now, on that note, though, we did... Oh, sorry. We prepared all of our food beforehand? Yeah. Did yeah. you just say that? Yeah, I did. Okay, sorry. We're good. <laughs> And because of all of this amazing food, we were able to travel through a very harsh, very unforgiving landscape and really enjoy it most of the time. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful, even on the hardest of days. Now, this is it. This is, this is the part. This place was so... Just imagine the starkness and absolute raw beauty of this area. 330 kilometers of shoreline. No roads. A, a snowmobile trail connecting the communities together. Um, to our right, or north, stretching up into the Labrador Plateau, all the way to Ungaba Bay, uh, unbroken wilderness, except for maybe the Labrador Highway, but you know what I mean. We got to travel over places I'd only dreamed about, places I'd only read about in trip reports. We got to walk over these famous rivers that I've, I've only ever imagined. We walked over top of the St. Augustine, the Petite and Grand Makatna, the Edamamu, Netagamu and the Alamin River. And those are just the big ones. There are hundreds of smaller ones that we walked over. And it was just a dream come true, for, true to be able to see these things in real life and imagine where the headwaters are coming from. Yeah, it's just the possibilities are absolutely endless out there. And even on the hardest of days where we were like, man, I'd really love to just have a shower or I'd really love to just sleep in a cotton sheet. That'd be so nice. You're still already scheming how you can get back there and when you can go and where you can go again because it's so amazing. But the landscape being as harsh and unforgiving as it is, we really had to dictate our days based on where we could make camp and gather the firewood for our wood stove. Because of this, some days were cut very short, even though the traveling was good, and other days went uncomfortably long, as all of us can attest to on any trip. So oftentimes we could get stuck in a place on top of some hills where you'd walk for kilometers on end when you wouldn't come across a tree that was any taller than you. We couldn't camp there with a the wood stove, so we would go further. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we would stop at a river valley knowing there was an ocean uh, bay crossing, 12-kilometer bay cro crossing coming, and we'd have to set up camp because we knew we wouldn't be able to get to the other side by nightfall. Yep. And in a landscape such as this, where some places there are trees and a lot of places there aren't trees, your perspective is very much skewed. You could look somewhere and see a hill and go, boy, how am I going to get over that? But then when you get to the hill, it's only 50 feet tall. It's like a boulder and you thought it was a mountain. It's, there's, no perspe there's nothing to gauge your perspective off And of. other times you could be standing there and looking at your entire day's walk 20 kilometers ahead of you. Yep, those are long days. <laughs> But they're beautiful days. Um, so the landscape very much... Uh, um, would dictate what we would do. Would dictate how we would travel, mm -hmm. uh, how far. One of the most amazing things for us was tr walking over top of the frozen ocean, which is not something that we have in Nova Scotia, really. Sometimes some bays freeze a bit, but we would not walk out onto them. And walking over three, four, or five feet of sea ice was really, really pretty cool. And one campsite in particular, we had the tide come in to this really large bay. And those of you who have been skating on freshwater lakes in the winter, all that noise that the ice makes as it expands and contracts and really kind of un otherworldly sounds, imagine that being magnified by a hundred times in a big ocean bay and the whole tide just like coming in and shifting everything and then going out. It was really incredible. And for us, we like to travel under human power because we are then available and open to those little miraculous things that you miss if you go whizzing by with a motor behind you. And so we really believe in the power of traveling slowly and intimately with the landscape. And the people that live in this landscape have very much been affected and formed by that same experience of living on a very harsh, beautiful land. So us, as with the local inhabitants of this area, over time became part of the landscape. We weren't fighting the landscape. We weren't trying to beat the landscape. 
these places deserve respect. And without that, you'll never, you're never going to accomplish what you set out to do. We were just two tiny little pink humans hoping for safe passage and one furry dog that just wanted to sleep. And we really just were in awe the fact that we felt safe <clears throat> and we felt cared for by the land. And the past, the present, and the future would all blend together. We would become literally part of the landscape. Because in the way we were traveling with our wood stove and our anoraks and our old snowshoes, your, our experience was no different really mm -hmm. than the people that came before us and the people that would come after us. And you feel a connection to the land that you can never forget. As we traveled through there, we met many people. We met people on the trail as we were walking. People would often stop and ask us, who, we are, who are you? Where are you going? What, what are you, are you doing? doing? <laughs> do, you, do you have a gun in there? Do you know there's wolves out here? Where's your snowmobile, really? We, but we met, we stopped in communities along the way, and we met a lot of really fantastic people. And the people there are very innovative, very creative, because you can't just run to the hardware store when something breaks down. You have to be a carpenter, you have to be an electrician, you have to help your brother and your father and your sister build your houses, fix things, get your boat in the water. It's really isolated in all of those communities. But because of this route blanche in the winter, they can really get to travel at free will. They're not reliant on the ferry in the summer and they're not reliant on the planes that are very expensive. So it's a very, very innovative, very stubborn, very proud culture. Very independent, very solitary, and yes, very, very proud people. During the winter time up there, the, the communities, the people living within them gained freedom. It's the only time of the year they could come and go as they wished. It's the only time of year they could travel to the neighboring communities and see family members whenever they wanted to. In the summertime, many of these people are fishermen, but not all of them have big boats, not all of them can travel freely. But in the wintertime, they can. They can go where they want when they please. It's a and real cause of celebration. They love the winter because it means freedom and visiting, and every community has a festival, a big winter festival. And we got to be a part of a couple of them, which was very cool. They have big hockey tournaments, believe it or not. Cutthroat hockey tournaments between towns is a big, big deal. Really amazing. Uh, <clears throat> Osa's growing fan base. This is in one of the schools. This is in uh, Harrington Harbor. Um, and in a lot of these rural communities, in any part of the country, really, um, we're seeing shrinking communities and the consolidation of infrastructure. So this part of Quebec did not miss out on relocation settlement programs. Um, this was a popular thing by the Labrador, Newfoundland Labrador government starting in the 1950s. Um, also with this part of Quebec. So for those of you who are not familiar with a resettlement program, the government would basically come into a community and say, we don't want to pay for the infrastructure in this town anymore. We don't want to pay for electricity coming here, for your health centers, for your schools. We don't want to pay for your roads. We will give you a lump sum for your house and for your property. I highly suggest you take it, because if you don't, we're taking it anyway. And you won't get anything. And you won't get anything. So people were forced and most took the deals to leave land that had been in their families for years and the rhythm of life very much changed in that people in the summers would live traditionally on the coast and then in the winter they would move inland to be closer to firewood supplies and sheltered, not be on the, right on the water for the storms that would roll in in the winter. So years ago there were dozens of communities up and down the coastline and for those of you who've seen the coast of Labrador and all the abandoned communities along there, this is no different. One of these communities that stands out the most was a place called Elmer Sound. Um, and of all the people, we did stay with a couple of families and we met lots of the local people, but the two who stood out the most were Howard and Patsy Anderson. These are the last two people living in Elmer Sound. Everybody else from that community took the resettlement package and moved away. These two, stubbornly, refused. And we were very grateful for them to bring us in, feed us way too much food, like way, way, way too much food. We were feeling sick when they just kept piling it into us, and it was great. But to share the table with them and hear their stories and hear their perspective on the rifts that have developed between family and friends over these resettlement offers and the changing fabric of this community and of the whole coastline. So very quickly, Dave and I started to realize that what we were walking through, as most things in life do, constantly change and that it was very much a bittersweet 
existence for these people because we could appreciate how beautiful it was and I wouldn't want to leave either. So it became very much a part of our considerations walking through the communities. Now, it wasn't all sunny days and beautiful, trust me. We did see it all. We saw rain. A lot of rain. Like a lot of rain. Who, it doesn't rain in the winter. Three times it rained 30 plus millimeters. We didn't bring us. raincoats because we were so worried about it being cold. So bring a raincoat if you ever go on a winter trip. Seriously. Anywhere. Anywhere. We did have rubber boots, thankfully, but we never expected that. It rained. We saw blizzards. We saw whiteouts. We saw the storms. And we tried really hard to capture pictures because we're sharing our story, we're sharing the things that we're learning with everyone that's following. The RCGS would like some really nice images we want to share with them as well. And it's when it comes down to it, we're storytellers, not photographers. No, and so taking photos when it's minus 26 and blowing so hard that your sled is pulling you across a bay is really challenging. Your battery gets cold, so for, it's like, okay, I gotta take a picture. I have to take a picture today. So you get your big mittens off, and now your fingers are getting cold. You gotta get your battery out of your pocket so it doesn't freeze. You get it into your camera, you take the lens cap off. Ah, uh, the one bird that you saw all day has now left. So you take a picture of Dave and his balaclava. That's cool, that's why that works. And then you gotta do it all in reverse, and then you hope that the picture worked out, and oh, you fogged up your viewfinder. Every picture that we have is a miracle, really. <laughs> and your hands are getting really cold, and you got to get moving right away. But the cold dictates more than just whether your pictures are going to turn out or not. That, that is correct, yes. The cold and the wind in an environment such as this very much becomes a living, breathing thing. It becomes something that is trying to get inside of your clothing at all times. And at certain times, we found it to be quite claustrophobic. Kind of scary at times, actually. Because you can't escape it. You can't it's, escape. There's nowhere to hide. Even when you put your hood up and you have all your layers on, it's just trying to get into every seam. It's finding its way down your back and up your neck and in your pants. And it's crazy. It's super crazy. But what's even neater than all of the cold is the mind that even though we are these very fragile pink creatures moving through the landscape, we have these minds that can overcome those challenges and dig deep and find the presence of mind to know that we will be okay. And even when your beard is icing up, you know that there's the strength within you to keep going and that you can think clearly and you become very meditative through everything. It becomes a very mindful existence. The whole trip in one fell swoop is really overwhelming, but you become so focused on surviving, it's just this foot, that foot, this foot, that foot, eat some food, this foot, that foot. It becomes a moving meditation for the entire trip. That's right. And just on a side note there, beards don't actually keep you warmer. They actually make you colder because then the moisture freezes up on them and just a side note, sorry. Um, one of the wonderful things about, that I find about traveling in the wintertime is that all of your movements need to be methodical. You need to have routines. You need to think about everything you do with precision and you need to be calculated. Everything takes longer and more thought to accomplish. And without, taking, without having that precision and that thought and that mindfulness, there can be some real consequences when you're out there. But when you're prepared and you're cautious and you take the time to do everything, you're able to stay safe and enjoy yourself. It's really amazing what you're actually able to accomplish. Far more than you think. On all of the trips that we've ever been on, we always get the token, you're crazy, I'd never do that. That's so scary, you could have died. It's like really the only time we could have died was in the whole crazy mess of driving through blizzards and taking ferries and flying to get to where we started. Once we were out on the land, the risk that was there was very much controlled because we're confident in our capabilities. The answer is always, my answer is always very similar. We have real risk and perceived risk. There is real risk. You can die out there, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. But a lot of the risk is perceived, and a lot of it is mitigated through proper prior planning, about thinking things through, having experience using Common Safe, and watching each other's backs at all times. Absolutely. It's really important. Yeah. Now, some of you may have noticed in one of those really blustery pictures that there was a second dog with us. 
We can't give a presentation without mentioning this little guy. This is a dog that tagged along with us from a community that he showed up right when we got there. And we thought, oh, you know, he's just going to come along for the parade. A lot of dogs do. We're dragging two giant sleds filled with food. Anybody's going to want to tag along. We smell really interesting. And he just never left. He just stayed with us. He this, stayed with us through town. He this stayed dog took one look at us and said, this is my ticket out of here. He had no collar. He was disgusting. He smelled bad, very skinny. He <laughs> followed us for eight days through the woods. If he, we were like waiting for him to give up and be like, you guys are nuts. I'm going home to my garbage dump. This is not cool. But he just stayed and he was just so wanting affection. And we had no idea what we were going to do with him. We had extra dog food because somehow we had extra dog food. He ate anything and everything we would give him. Osa and he got along really well. And Frank now has been lovingly adopted to friends of friends of friends of ours in Nova Scotia. And he leads a very, very happy life eating better than Dave and I do on any given day. Dehydrated deer liver for dinner. Like, uh. so. Frank is one smart dog. Frank is one smart dog. So, so, there's so much that we could share with you, and we just want to say thank you. This has really been amazing. Stories could go on all yeah. night, absolutely. But come talk to us if you want to learn anything else. Um, but what we do want to share with you is that traveling through these wild places is something really important that I think most of us know, even if we're armchair appreciators of adventure or we're out there in the thick of it doing it ourselves. But when we're out there in the wild, it truly allows us to see what we are made of and encourages us to go deeply within ourselves beyond the souvenirs of memories and photographs, and sometimes a small black dog, we are given a little burning candle to carry in our hearts when we return home from our adventures. It burns brightly and reminds us of the challenges that we've faced, the joys that we have experienced, and the beauty of the wilderness that awaits our future embrace. Once you have been, once you have dreamed have been to these wildest of places, experienced and pushed your body and mind to the limits. It becomes hard to return to everyday life. It becomes part of who you are, deep within your marrow, always searching for that climax again. Whether you have found it through exhaustion, accomplishment, enlightenment, or simply being in those wild places. When we're back in our everyday lives, and we're getting caught up in the hustle and bustle, we're paying our bills and we're going to work, it's important for me, it's important for all of us to know that these deep, wild places still exist. It's important to know that they exist exactly as they were when we were there, and it's important to know that they will still be there for us to return one day. Go winter. Thank you. Thank you.